Once again, here's George Vradenberg. Uh, thank you, Senator Warner, for joining us today at the National Alzheimer's Summit. Uh, you've been such a champion in this space for so many years. Uh, we want to thank you for your support. Uh, and uh, we'd really like to get your views on where we are today and where we are moving forward. So I'd, let's just start with why does Alzheimer's get the kind of bipartisan support uh, that it does in Congress? Because it is the case that virtually everything that's done in Alzheimer's is bipartisan. Absolutely. And first of all, George, thank you. Um, I think we all have personal stories. I know your personal story and the fact of this wonderful organization, Us Against Alzheimer's, the difference you're all making. You know, my personal story is that my mom had it for 11 years. Nine years she didn't speak. My dad and my sister um, took care of her 24-7 as caregivers. We had a little bit of help on the weekends. And I saw what that did not only to my mom, but to my whole family. And all of us have stories like that. My partner on a lot of this Alzheimer's legislation is Susan Collins. And I'm proud to say we've got two bills going to the president right now around Alzheimer's in terms of reauthorization of the Alzheimer's Act, as well as trying to make sure the NIH continues to do an annual update of what our goals ought to be. Um, and I think I remember Susan talking about her dad. So this. This notion, Alzheimer's doesn't know Democrat, Republican, doesn't know liberal, conservative, uh, and it is, it is a human crisis, but as I'm sure we'll get into it, it is also a financial crisis to our government if we can't grapple with this hugely devastating disease. Well, we had, uh, as you know, and as you've led on this, uh, a goal of uh, trying to prevent or treat uh, Alzheimer's by 2025. We're about to come up to 2025. We've made some historic advances against that goal with now two disease-modifying drugs which slow down the progression of the disease. Those drugs are now in clinical trials in people who do not yet have symptoms on the hypothesis that if we slow the disease down earlier in its course, we'll get a greater impact of these drugs. So that's been terrific. Progress has been terrific. Give me a little you know, blue sky kind of thing about what we ought to try and shoot for by 2035. Well, again, progress has been terrific, and we've also been able, as again, through your and other leadership as well, to find those genetic markers that indicate if you've got that propensity. Um, and I think that's important as well. But I think as we think towards 2035, we need to think about prevention on a way that we may not ever get to 100% prevention, but if we can get to 70, 80, 90%, um, I think one of the areas that we uh, offer, could offer great upside as well, that may not be directly related to specific drug therapies against Alzheimer's, but we know that obesity, heart disease, tend towards uh, exacerbating those traits. And as we've seen the kind of Ozempic revolution um, in terms of being able to potentially cut back on obesity, type 2 diabetes, you know, I think that could also slow the onset of Alzheimer's. So I think we need to be bold because, again, you'll have the data better than I. If we don't, and with the aging of our population, uh, just treatment of this disease, not, not just from the federal government standpoint, but from the human standpoint of the caregivers, could literally break the bank. Well, you put your finger on exactly where I think we ought to go. We ought to intervene in midlife yes. <clears throat> against those cardio, cardio metabolic conditions and the lifestyle factors that might reverse those. Uh, and the question about what policy the United States government might adopt in order to encourage more aggressive treatment or more aggressive efforts at cardio metabolic disease will, as you say, uh, have an impact on future prevalence of the disease. So it's really smart. But what can the government do? Uh, to... Here's one of the things, I'm, I'm not sure this would be solely the role of the government, it might be kind of all of society. Um, you know, we think back about technology, innovation, and healthcare, whether it's new drugs, new procedures, my wearable device that monitors. We've not really measured technology improvements in healthcare in terms of lowering overall healthcare costs. I think we, you know, we need to have a little better accountability. And, you know, I am, um, interested in not, not only kind of insurance rate uh, adjustment, uh, if people lead healthier lifestyles, we've got now 
ability with metrics to help encourage better behavior. This is not some government, you know, overdoing. But I do think we ought to provide rewards for people who do make those behavior modifications. And that may be your insurance rates. And because we've, again, got a lot more data now uh, with the, and that's even before we see the whole advances of artificial intelligence in this field. I think that's really smart. Uh, again, the notion of using a whole of society approach, uh, because the last round of this in uh, the NAPA process, the National Alzheimer's Project Act process, was mostly government agency work, right. trying to get business involved. Uh, we have a business collaboration effort on how to increase the brain health of employees, mm -hmm. both for anticipating, uh, as you say, these cardiometabolic conditions, uh, which may in fact reduce future prevalence, but also to encourage brain resilience. Because one of the factors that actually will encourage improved brain performance is socialization at work. Your best friend is at work, you come to work, you do better. And some companies are now beginning to encourage their employees to get more active on school boards and more active in local community activities because they know that that kind of capacity for socialization redounds to the capacity of employees to work together at work. Absolutely. I think so, that is dead on. I also think I'm maybe I'm sounding my age and a little old school. Um, you know, there are some jobs that may work better remote, but I think the vast majority of us do better in a setting where we have to interact in person uh, with uh, others. And I do think that socialization process we see time and again is so critical. Uh, so you mentioned the burden on a family, not just on the individual with dementia. Indeed, at some stage, the individual dementia really does not understand right. uh, their world around them. Uh, but you described a family where there are at least two caregivers. So we have what we think maybe 50 million people in the world with dementia, that means 100 million people who are probably caregivers around the world, disproportionately impacted on low-income populations, disproportionately impacting um, uh, uh, women, uh, both as caregivers and mm -hmm. as victims. Uh, and so I'm curious as to what we might do, and you have been leader in this, in thinking through how to improve the caregiving workforce and the caregiving burden. Well, we, we again, my family, I was able to support my family financially through that burden. I mean, my sister quit quit work full time. Um, I think we need to do more. I think there's indications, for example, there's some s small ball um, or mid-sized legislation we're looking at to say a, a caregiver, if they leave work to provide uh, care, could still contribute to their IRA even though they're not employed. And if then if they go back to work, they might be able to m make it up. I think we need to um, look at you know, Medicare reimbursement in terms of caregivers uh, in, in, around Alzheimer's. I think this is a field, um, and again, it's probably what brought most of the thousands of people who are watching this right now at your conference um, to the table because they've lived firsthand and seen that experience. This ought to be something we should lean into. And, and there are some governmental policies, but I also think, again, greater collaboration with the business sector uh, where the level of, of, of more generous leave um, is something that all, ought to be con all ought to be considered. This is not something we're going to solve by a government program alone. Uh, it is interesting because we other businesses we talk to uh, describe brain health in terms not just of Alzheimer's or cardiometabolic conditions and the like, but also mental health. Uh, so that, in fact, greater investments and more frequent availability of mental health professionals to employee base is proving to c cause a reduction in overall health costs in business because people who don't have mental health and stress uh, and who deal with those problems are actually better performers at work. So it turns out that it has a redound a effect. Double bottom line. And, you know, and again, this is, <clears throat> there was huge, horrible things that came out of COVID. The one good thing that came out of COVID was I believe we moved telehealth forward a decade. And one of the areas where I think, um, at least the, the data I've seen in terms of the outcomes on mental health, um, this may be a technique that where telehealth can again be used much more actively. Um, those kind of 
consult sessions, can be done over Zoom, can be done you know, with some inpatient, but a lot more telehealth. We've got to make sure that we don't roll back uh, those improvements. We also got to make sure that we um, recognize that getting broadband to the, the balance of all Americans, you know, which we've promised in the infrastructure bill, becomes a reality because even some communities still can't even access those t- telehealth uh, capabilities, which in- include obviously mental health. Well, are state licensure laws getting in the in the way of telehealth, and is there an ability to set some minimal standards of some sort? Or uh, I, we made we that had traditionally been a problem, and then about medical professionals going beyond their state borders, we waived a lot of that uh, during COVID, and you. Know, it needs to be reviewed. A lot of that expires at the end of this calendar year. I think the vast majority of, of those uh, uh, bureaucracy removements ought to be maintained um, in, in terms of telehealth. And again, uh, I think on the, particularly on the mental health side, uh, the the data I've seen has been very, very positive. Um, you, um, uh, I lost my thought here because you mentioned something that really struck me. Uh, is a very smart idea, but I'll find it somewhere in the brain and come back to it. Um, but let me a- uh, ask you uh, about uh, uh, Medicare solvency. You mentioned not just the social costs, the impact on families um, of the disease, but also the cost. Right. Cost of government, cost of families. So I'm curious, as you, as a person who clearly is very focused on the solvency of Medicare and figuring out what we ought to do to make sure Medicare is there for a very long time. Absolutely. How, how do we deal with this? Medicare and Social Security are probably the two most successful government programs that we've had in this country. And when I think back to Social Security, when it first put in, was put in place, um, President Roosevelt promised we'd give folks a check if they hit 65. And at that point, average life expectancy in the 30s was about 57. So um, a good deal. It, it was a good deal. Uh, and we've got to mean we've got to be honest, and we've got to, particularly to younger people. A lot of people don't believe Social Security and Medicare will be there for them. Um, I think we need to honor those commitments. That will mean um, we've got to look on the revenue side uh, to make sure they're they are appropriately funded. It means things like on Social Security. I think raising the cap so that uh, uh, a greater percentage of your income pays into the Social Security trust fund, and that could be adjusted by by annual basis. And we do, um, not to try to lower cost for the sake of cost lowering itself, uh, but we need to try to find find savings. And I continue to believe that the promises of technology and healthcare, uh, there's not a procedure, drug, or device that isn't promising savings. We've not captured those on a on a systemic way. And I think going forward, as we go into the debate next year about the tax code, um, thinking about you know, actually putting, pushing technology, but making sure that we recoup some savings for the long-term health of Medicare is terribly important. And in, and, you know, the same case in Social Security. The striking thing about the investment you're making in, uh, in Alzheimer's investments is a, a claim that made by Roy Blunt, not a claim, but a, an assertion. He calculated out what the increase in healthcare costs due to Alzheimer's were occurring in Medicare and Medicaid, and what that trajectory is based upon the aging of the population. Uh, and he saw that it was going to be equal to roughly the Defense Department by the early 2040s. And he said, we're investing a pittance against trying to save money against this. One of the challenges here is how to assure that if you make earlier interventions, earlier and earlier interventions against this disease, the harder it is to justify those cost savings. You're going to get much more cost savings, but how do we track them? How do we have the discipline to make sure that what we're doing today to reduce the costs uh, of this disease through earlier intervention is a cost that increases now, but we can assure that we can track the cost reductions? And, th- and that is that is a challenge. I mean, um, the congressional scorekeeper, the congressional budget office uh, doesn't do a great job on, on tracking these savings. But that shouldn't mean that we don't take this issue on because, again, anyone who's experienced this disease, as we all have, knows that if we could have 
put that off even for a few years or even in some cases months. And one of the reasons why some of the drug therapy I'm, I'm so encouraged by, you know, has both a huge societal benefit, but also has a cost benefit. Yeah, one last question. Uh, kind of the thing I remembered uh, was the, the mention of possibly extension family leave uh, so that, in fact, people who have to step out of the workforce uh, in order to take care of a parent, not just a child, uh, can get some sort of benefit and assistance from the government. I know that was part of Build Back Better. Um, uh, that I think, listen, I think the whole question of paid family leave, you know, we're the only industrial country in the world that really doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. What's included or not would be a, a you know, subject of a great deal of debate. But let's see if we can actually build that into the system. Um, because again, if you can provide that person that flexibility on leave, he or she then can come back to work, don't have to potentially quit. And uh, I think about this at the, at the, on the macro basis, that means a stronger economy. Absolutely. And so, again, these things all come together. I, I know our time's about up, but I just want to thank you again. But I also want to thank all the folks who are engaged in this great organization. This is, this is a battle we must win. Absolutely. And we all thank you for your leadership on this and your great articulation and in creativity and how to approach this problem. So thank you very much. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you, George and Senator Warner. We'll take a short break, and when we return, our next panel will explore how best to embrace innovative technology while advancing brain health equity. That's coming up at 3.30 Eastern. Please stay with us for more of the 2024 National Alzheimer's Summit.